Okay, so I will start to share my slides now. Let's start the lecture. Maybe somebody will join later. But anyways, uh, it's time now. I hope you can see the, uh, the, the slides now. Yes. Can you? Great. Okay, so uh, here we will. Last time we were talking about these locations in general, and we went through a few points shown here. We stopped here after the bubble raft, uh, and uh, we are still left with uh, transmission electron micro microscopy, which will be our first uh, topic for today. And then we will go into today's topic, which is the linear elastic description of these locations, which will be um, yeah what we are going to discuss today. So I will now jump over all the slides that we had and go, here we go, transmission electron microscopy. This is still part of the slide set that I uploaded uh, last time, <clears throat> if you're looking for it. Okay, so uh, we were um, discussing ways and possibilities to observe these locations. Um, the most important method to observe these locations is transmission electron microscopy. Um, I sketched here the principle of, of TEM, transmission electron microscopy, shortly. It's based on Bragg's law. Um, so that means that um, um, basically waves are scattered and transmitted on uh, lattice planes. Uh, and depending on the wavelength, the angle, and the lattice spacing, um, we have the Bragg conditions met or the Bragg condition met or not met. Uh, here uh, is shown the Bragg condition. I will switch on my laser pointer. So we have uh, this expression here. Lambda is the wavelength of the incoming electron. Um, uh, N is just a um, number, uh, integer number. So it can be one, two, three, four. D is the spacing between the lattice planes. And then we have theta, which is the angle that uh, is shown here, is basically the angle of the um, incoming electron uh, with the lattice plane. And G is the diffraction vector, which um, specifies the planes we are selecting for doing the diffraction experiment. And to give, you, to give you an idea about the wavelength uh, in a typical uh, experiment where the electrons are um, coming in with 100 uh, kilo electron volt, for example, the wavelength would be 0.37 uh, angstrom, which is um, smaller than a typical distance between atoms. Typical distances between atoms are in the angstrom regime. For metals, it's like two or three uh angstroms in, in that regime okay so the, the main way to determine whether there is a dislocation in the material by tm is to uh, get near to this condition in your sample and then as shown here now uh, to the right uh, due to the rotation of the lattice planes around this location there will be places where then the, um, the condition is met exactly and then you have uh, on this, in these neighboring um, regions of the dislocation, you will meet um, a condition and that will give you diffraction in specific locations around the dislocation, whereas in the rest you have transmission as shown here. And that means that uh, you will see a dark uh, line um, in your TM experiment. That's the principle of TM, of determining dislocations by TM. So you don't see the dislocation itself. So, but what you see is, um, is the rotation of the lattice plane. Here I show uh, a typical example uh, of um, a TM measurement as can be seen uh, in the literature uh, or in, 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 in yeah, online. Uh, this is an example from this um, publication here. Um, and you see here a lot of straight lines. These are all screw locations in a BCC crystal. 
as explained in this work here. And this is another example that I've taken from the book of Harlan Bacon, which shows an, an additional interesting capability of a TM, that is to also uh, see and uh, determine the Burgess vector of a dislocation. Uh, and that is done by um, selecting appropriately uh, the diffraction vector G. So if you select um, the planes onto which you do the diffraction experiment carefully, or if you change it, as shown here, you can see uh, the different orientation of the diffraction vector. And uh, also your TM image will change um, because there's something um, like an invisibility criterion, uh, which is shown here. So if the Burgess vector is parallel to the um, a diffraction vector, you will not see the dislocation. And so by changing the G and uh, looking where this location appears or disappears, you can actually determine what Burgess vector this dislocation has. I try to explain here um, why you actually don't see a dislocation if the Burgess vector is parallel to the diffraction vector. Uh, I've sketched it here. Um, um, taking uh, an image from Harlan Bacon. So this is um, the material without a dislocation. You have here the planes and uh, here the diffraction vector that you could choose here, for example, or you could also choose this diffraction vector here. Now, if you look, if you insert a screw dislocation here, what you will have, you will have a bending of the lattice plane, a rotation of the lattice planes as shown here. And so it, you see, that if you now uh, go uh, from this direction, you will see no change in G due to the dislocation. And so you will um, not observe the dislocation. Whereas if you come from this side, you see that something has changed. Uh, and, um, uh, and for that reason, you will then see the dislocation in the diffraction experiment. So, um, that is the principle how this works. Um, one can monitor um, uh, uh, dislocations uh, conveniently. And I also want to present you two videos which show how this works. I've just taken them from YouTube. You can also look them up here. Um, just want to share this with you. You may have seen such videos before, but these are really in situ experiments where one images with TEM dislocations and can see how they move. So there is some stress applied to the sample and then you can see how these locations really uh, bow out and move and how they behave uh, in the material. So I think this is really a great technique uh, to image uh, these locations. Here we can see, for example, another video uh, where um, we can see a real sequence of these locations being emitted from a source and how these dislocations then move through the material as one applies a load. A load is always required in order to displace these locations. But um, uh, yeah, that's it more or less. I hope you can see my, uh, you could see the videos. Could you see the videos? Yes. All right, excellent. Okay. So this ends now my introductory part on these locations. Uh, are there any questions you would like to ask now before we plunge into a linear elasticity, which is more than a mathematical? Mm -hmm. Not so far, okay. So let's go on. How we can do that. Yes. Locations in a linear elastic homogeneous medium. So I want to just review very uh, shortly the essential equation which determines uh, linear elasticity. Um, the conditions which uh, lead to the central equation, which is shown here, are these two. So that uh, if I look at an element um, of my linear elastic medium, I should not uh, get any net torque on an element. Uh, so if I imagine that I have forces acting on an element, they have to compensate so that there is no a net torque on the element and there should be also no net force 
uh, on the elements. So the no network means that um, the uh, sigma ij is equal to sigma ji. Yeah? That has to be fulfilled. And also, uh, in order to have no net torque, the derivative of uh, the stress um, should compensate, um, basically, should also be zero uh, or should be compensated by uh, body forces, which is shown here. So, for example, if you uh, add uh, up the dif uh, different stresses, uh, or forces acting on an element, overall, uh, the forces should then be zero so that there is no net force which would displace this volume element in any direction. So these conditions then lead in the end to the equation which determines the displacement field. Um, that is, if I look at every point of my linear elastic medium and I introduce a defect or I apply a load to it, then the points will move. And the motion of that point is described by U. This is the displacement field. Um, you have already uh, gone through this, of course, in all detail with David. I'm just reviewing this now. And the, derivative, the second derivative of the displacement field with respect to the Cartesian coordinates um, multiplied by the uh, elastic constants plus the body forces should be zero. Body forces are in most situations zero anyways. So body force would be something which is in the material and creates an additional force. So you could imagine, for example, that you have a charge embedded in my uh, homogeneous medium. And if I apply an electric field, then I this charge would actually be uh, pushed in, a some, in some direction. And this would create a body force in a specific point of my medium. Um, so this is the way you can visualize or imagine a body force in a medium. In most cases, however, body forces are zero and um, the equation is then even easier. The equation just um, in the end then is given by this expression here. That the second derivative of the displacement field um, with respect to the Cartesian coordinates multiplied with the uh, elastic constant tensor is zero. Then we have an important uh, uh, principle which has to be satisfied, and that is um, uh, the principle of superposition. We had already a remark last time whether solutions add up, or how is it with uh, addition of two different defects? So this is a very important um, uh, principle. If I have a solution and I have uh, a second solution, so if I have two solutions, uh, which belong to a defect or a certain loading state, then I can always add them up. And also uh, the addition, linear addition of my displacement field will also be a solution. And that goes back to the fact that the differential equation that we have seen previously, this equation, uh, the, the differential equation is linear. And for that reason, one can always also um, find a solution by adding solutions together. And uh, superposition holds for displacement, strain, and stress, but it does not hold for the energy, right? So for displacement, strain, and stress, I can just add up uh, the displacements that I know, uh, for example, uh, from a dislocation or from a point source of expansion or uh, another defect uh, and get the solution of the two defects together. But uh, if I want to know the energy of the two defects, I cannot just add the individual energies up because we have cross terms. And this is shown here. Uh, the linear elastic energy of uh, a system of a certain volume which contains uh, defects or is under load in general is given by the multiplication of the stress times the strain uh, times uh, one half. Uh, so we can replace now the stress by using Hooke's law um, uh, with the strain. And then we get this expression here, this expression here. And now we can imagine we have two solutions. And if we insert now the two solutions and we multiply it, then we get four terms. And the first two are the energies of the individual defects, the individual solutions. But we have here cross terms, as you can see here, and the cross terms are non-zero. 
And the cross term is also the reason why, for example, I have an attraction of two defects in a material. If I place, for example, a solid element close to this location, the solid has a certain elastic field, the dislocation has a certain elastic field, and uh, together, um, the elastic, so the, the fields, uh, they add up, the displacement fields, but the energy uh, has a cross term, and this cross term is the interaction energy between the solid, for example, and the dislocation. The cross term can be positive or negative. If it's positive, then there is repulsion between the two defects. If there is attraction, then uh, the cross term is negative. Okay, so this is very important to uh, um, keep in mind that energies do not add up, uh, but the displacement field, the strain and the stresses, they do add up uh, in linear elasticity. There is one um, case where this is not uh, uh, true or where the cross term is zero, so that you really have a linear addition. It's a, spe a specific case when you imagine that you have a body, which is shown here by this ellipse. And now you imagine that you, put, uh, that you put it under load and you have some stress acting on the surface of this body, then you would deform it. And you could imagine that you have to apply a certain um, uh, stress and you will displace the material by some amount, which gives you the energy, because the energy basically is uh, force times distance. And now you can imagine I have the same situation, but I have some defects inside. And uh, the defects um, will now uh, also um, uh, deform with the body, but they are locked in these um, uh, defects, that means that they are not moving around, they themselves do not respond to the stress. And in this case, due to the principle of superposition, you uh, have to, uh, basically the, the stress here adds up linearly to these stresses. And so you cannot tell from outside whether you have a defect or not. And that means that the energy that you apply from outside is the same with or without defects. This follows from the principle of superposition. And that means that in this special case of external and internal stresses, which are locked in, there is no cross term. And in this case, you can really uh, add up the, um, uh, the energy that you need to deform this body and the individual energies of the defects. And you can add them up and get the energy of the total system. But this is a special case. In general, if I look at defects, then the energy of, uh, for example, defect S2 and defect S3, um, uh, the energy of, of both together is different uh, than the energy of the individual defects S2 and S3. All right, so uh, this was something general about um, the linear elasticity and finding solutions in linear elasticity. Now we're going to see um, uh, uh, how one can actually get the displacement field stress strain uh, for screw dislocations and edge dislocations. The general procedure to find the solutions for the displacement and for the stresses then, uh, but in the end, the equation is here for the displacement field, and then you can derive from the displacement field stress and strain easily. Um, the procedure is uh, that you uh, try to solve this equation here uh, for the different boundary conditions which determine which uh, dislocations, uh, which dislocation you want to investigate. Here I show one specific example, which is the screw dislocation. Uh, remember to introduce a dislocation. What you need to do is to make a cut and to displace uh, the material at the cut with respect to each other. And this procedure really determines which dislocation you have. So you have to solve the differential equation by taking into account the boundary condition to find the solution. That's the procedure how you uh, in practice then um, uh, proceed in order to find the solution um, or for the dislocation displacement field, stress field and strain field. Here uh, is now uh, some specifics of the screw dislocation. Uh, it's just a um, uh, uh, refinement essentially of the equation shown before. So 
since um, in the screw dislocation you have some uh, symmetry, more specifically the, you have cubic symmetry, um, you only have um, uh, the displacement field in one direction, which is non-zero. So this is the third dimension along the um, dislocation line shown here. So we have x1, x2, x3. And also uh, only um, uh, these expressions are non-zero. So the equation gets somewhat more simple. So we just have to differentiate the displacement along the um, third coordinate for, um, with respect to x1 and x2. In the isotropic case, the other ones are zero. And the boundary condition is given here in this way. The boundary condition, if you look here, is exactly to make the cut and displace. And that means that U3, that means the displacement along this uh, parallel to the dislocation line, that that one jumps discontinuously when uh, moving from uh, below to above, right? So if I have here, this is uh, the displacement field as a function of x1 and x2. If I go from very small um, x2, just slightly negative, to very small positive x2, then I have a jump, a discontinuous jump, which is, a j, uh, which is equal to the Burgess vector. So this is the boundary condition. And in order to fulfill the boundary condition and also the uh, uh, differential equation, the solution has to be uh, as shown here. So this is um, um, the expression, the mathematical expression for the displacement fit of the screw dislocation is given by the arcus tangens function uh, multiplied by the Burgess vector divided by two pi. Um, you can prove that this is a solution just by inserting into the equation, in the previous equation, if you were to take the derivatives, you would see that actually you get zero. And importantly, you also satisfy the, uh, the, the boundary condition, because if you look at the arcus tangens function as shown here, you see that it naturally does what it has to do. It jumps, it has a discontinuity um, at a specific point, And in this way, it satisfies exactly the boundary condition. So um, uh, arcus tangens functions are always involved when one deals with a mathematical description of dislocations of the um, uh, displacement field. Uh, you always have arcus tangens functions because they have this cut and they fulfill also the other properties of um, the differential equation. Yeah, so uh, once you have the solution to the differential equation, which satisfies also the boundary condition, uh, this expression in, term, uh, in case of screw dislocation, um, then it's very easy to get the strain and the stress. The strain you get simply with the equation, um, where you derive the displacement with respect to the coordinates, uh, and then you get this solution here. So you can see this is just the derivative of the arcus, func uh, arcus tangens functions. And then you can also get the stress then by just using Hooke's law, which in the specific isotropic case then also reduces to this expression here. For the screw dislocation, all stresses um, shown here are zero. So uh, that would be tensile uh, stress uh, along one, two, and three are zero, and you also have no shear component in the plane. So the only non-zero shear stress is the one uh, uh, where the third uh, dimension is involved. Uh, I plot here also the expression for the, for the shear stress. So you can see that it is um, quite particular. It, it, it goes up and here down. And what you can see that it shoots up and uh, gets infinite exactly in the origin. So if you were to insert here zero for x1 and zero for x2, you would get uh, infinitely high stress. Uh, and this is something which is, which is specific to the linear elastic description of this location, which creates troubles. <laughs> That is that uh, in the origin exactly, uh, you, you have a, um, uh, a singularity and uh, this singularity then um, um, has to be somehow 
uh, dealt with. Uh, there are ways then to go beyond linear elasticity, which I will discuss next week, um, uh, where then really these singularities do not arise. But if you really stick to a completely linear elastic description of this location, you get a singularity uh, exactly uh, in the origin. Okay, the same thing for uh, edge dislocations. Here we have a little bit different um, simplification. We have plane strain conditions. We also have isotropic elasticity for the moment. So our derivation only uh, is valid for iso isotropic elasticity. Um, anisotropic elasticity is much more complicated. If you want to go through it, I can recommend the book by Hirt and Lotti. Um, but it's much more involved. And uh, in, for that reason, it's actually very rare that uh, anisotropic uh, treatments are done uh, for dislocation models, for simple dislocation models. Um, if you want to really treat uh, materials anisotropically, um, then the effort is much bigger and the complication is much higher. Um, this said, I have to say that uh, most materials are anisotropic, <laughs> so it's actually rare that you have um, uh, isotropic material. Uh, for example, tungsten is an isotropic material, elastically isotropic, but most metals and also most other crystals are not isotropic. Okay, so uh, this just a little bit about isotropic elasticity, but um, in principle, we have plane strain conditions. That means that um, U3 is zero. Um, the derivative with respect to the third coordinates are all zero. We have then the displacement along one uh, direction, one direction two, which depend also on the directions. Um, and, and these are the uh, uh, relevant uh, non-zero uh, bars of the displacement field. For the boundary condition, now we have two possibilities. Um, the screw dislocation just has one way of creating it. You have to cut and then you displace uh, parallel to the dislocation line. There's just one possibility. For the edge dislocation, there are in principle two, uh, two possibilities, which both give uh, the same edge dislocation in terms of stress and strain, but it's not the same edge dislocation in terms of displacement field. I want to just shortly explain you how this is uh, uh, how this is uh, understood. So, as shown in the very beginning, um, we have two cylinders here uh, where you make a cut and you make a displacement. No, normal to the dislocation line. You can cut here and open. So the, the, the Burgess vector is here now shown would be exactly the displacement of the surfaces with respect, with respect to each other. And this displacement is uh, normal to the dislocation line, but you can do it also here. So you can make the cut somewhere else and uh, do the same displacement and you will create uh, something which looks different, but in the end is also an edge dislocation and is really equivalent in terms of stress and strain. But I want to show you a little bit in an atomistic thinking, if we had a simple cubic uh, uh, material, how this would look like. Um, just first, uh, how does the solution look like um, for the edge dislocation? It's more complicated than what we had for the screw dislocation. We have the displacement uh, field along the uh, second coordinate, which is shown here, uh, which is here going upwards, um, is given by this expression here. It contains a logarithm, uh, whereas the displacement uh, along the x1 direction um, is given again by Arcus Tangens function, which always has to be there. So we can actually have the cut also, but they look different. So the two solutions are not the same. Here we make the cut along uh, this portion here, and we displace the two uh, um, parts of the material as shown here. And then we have to insert the half plane to create the edge dislocation. In this case, we have made the cut here and have displaced this part outwards and this part inwards. 
And that also gives us an, an edge dislocation. You can recognize here the extra half plane, but the displacement field is not the same, looks a little bit different. Uh, nevertheless, if you now go and you take the um, derivatives to calculate the strain and the stress, these two dislocations have the same solution. And I show here uh, the stress field expression um, that you get for uh, edge dislocation. So we have here um, a tensile stress, a unidirectional tensile stress, which is non zero and long uh, along one one or along one one, along two two. We have the shear stress, which is non zero, and we have um, uh, the other uh, components of the stress tensor, which are then zero. So we have uh, the shear stress 3, 1, 1, 3, 3, 2, 2, 3 is zero. And uh, the sigma 3, 3 is here given uh, from uh, the uh, stress uh, along 1, 1 and 2, 2 by multiplication with the Poisson ratio. Uh, also, hydrostatic stress can be obtained um, from the stress tensor as shown here. D in these expressions is given by the uh, shear modulus times Burgess factor divided by 2 pi, 1 minus the Poisson ratio. So this is the expression. I do, I do not go through a detailed derivation of how one can obtain uh, this solution that, uh, that I have shown before. If you want, uh, you can uh, make an exercise and insert these expressions into the, um, um, uh, the, the, the differential equation and see that it's really a solution. But to derive this expression is quite involved. And I think uh, since there is not uh, a lot of time anyways in this, uh, for this lecture, I do not want to uh, use a full lecture just to derive these expressions here. Uh, but if you want to see that this really is a solution of the differential equation, uh, I can invite you to just try it out. It's not so difficult to do. Okay, and um, here now I would like to make uh, an exercise. Um, we have seen the mathematical expression, but now I would like and invite you to uh, just think a little bit by looking at the, um, at the dislocation, at this edge dislocation, to, to see what kind of uh, stress field, uh, shear stress field it has. Um, so please uh, try to open uh, this slide now, or this figure uh, in some editor where you can draw plus and minus. So we want to identify where in these regions here uh, shear stress is positive and where it's negative. Positive it is when the, um, the violet rectangle uh, deforms into this green uh, rectangle, this distorted rectangle, and a negative if it's um, distorting as shown here. So you can look where originally the um, uh, the material was located, that is the grid points. And then due to insertion of the dislocation, every grid point moved as shown by the black, um, by the black circle. And then you can see in, in these regions what kind of shear stress we have. Are you still there? Yes. Cannot see you. Is, yes. this, is this something you can do or is it uh, too complicated? I think so. I mean, um, can I make a guess now, or yeah. should I show my screen? I think that I just wait a second. Am I still sharing? Am I still sharing? Yes. I just don't see you at the moment. That's my problem. <laughs> um, yeah. Can are I you? Draw. Do you want to share? Okay. Do you want to share your drawing? Ah, okay. You can draw into my. That's also possible. Yeah. Okay. Is, Let's do it this way. Is this a negative? Here and this is a positive. Exactly, exactly. So this is the easy, uh, the the easier, yeah. part. and this is correct. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. This is correct. I mean, I have a bit of a problem for the top and bottom one because I don't see any deformation in the cell. 
Yeah, that is not so easy to do. I will uh, try. Yeah. Can you see my arrow? Yes. Okay. Try to look at, let's take, for example, this rectangle here. Um, this looks a bit negative. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. So this is negative, I guess. And yeah. I don't see you drawing now. Maybe you can just go no. on. Yeah, let's see. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, my drawing skills are not that great. This yeah, is, and let's do maybe also the other. Uh, this uh, looks also negative. Which one? Yeah. This ah, no, my... this, this, uh, okay, this, I have to admit that here it's extremely hard to see because uh, it has shifted so much that you cannot compare to the, to the, okay. You cannot compare. Let's do this one and the other one. I will just tell you that's then good enough. If we do them still. Okay, I mean, I guess this is positive. Yeah. This looks a bit positive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And then it's alternating. So this would be positive here. Maybe you can okay. still draw here a plus if you can still. Mm -hmm. So we have it correct in the video. And here it's negative yes okay. i admit here it's very hard to see one would have to draw the rectangle one would have to draw the rectangle um, exactly on top of it to see it. but mm -hmm. i think um uh you have uh, identified the regions uh, very well very nicely and okay. on the lines um the shear stress is zero is exactly zero yes okay okay mm -hmm. Yeah, on the line exactly it's zero. Yeah, I have, um, I will go back to my presentation. Mm -hmm. Have the others also uh, any comments from the other participants? <laughs> okay. But yeah, I, I think it was quite clear now uh, by Ulrich um, how this, um, how the stress looks like. Uh, if I go and take the the mathematical expression, I will now go back to my slides. Uh, we have now the drawing all the time inside. I think I have to um, clear that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so here is shown how it looks like then if you insert the, um, the expression here and you make um, and you just draw it on top of what we have seen before. So you see this negative, positive, uh, negative, positive change, and it's zero in between. Um, you may ask, how is this possible that this is here negative? Because if I insert here, for example, a positive x1 value and zero for x2, I would get uh, one over x1, <clears throat> and that is a positive number but d is actually negative um, d is the uh, contains the burgess vector and the burgess vector here in this image would point from uh, right to left and will be negative <laughs> you can maybe uh, try to determine also the burgess vector in this image with the rule that we that i have explained last time uh, if you want to make sure that the burgess vector really goes from uh, 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 right to left, right? I leave you this as an exercise. If you have any question, you can always ask me. Okay, so this is another um, uh, part of the stress tensor. This is a tensile stress component. Uh, I showed a sort of uh, deformation uh, related to this stress here. Um, so we are expanding along the X one direction. So you see that, uh, and it's not very surprising, that expansion is uh, uh, above um, uh, or is for positive x2 and uh, contraction is for negative x2. So um, this is uh, quite important. And maybe even more important is the hydrostatic stress field around the edge dislocation, which shows expansion uh, on top. Uh, so for positive x2 and contraction, uh, below where we have inserted the stress, uh, the, where we have inserted the extra 
half plane. Yeah, so this is maybe a very important um, thing to remember when uh, understanding Cottrell atmosphere. I think I've seen a student who will uh, tell us something about Cottrell atmospheres, if I'm correct. So, yes. yes, okay, yeah. So that is basically a very important uh, fact for Cottrell atmospheres that you have, uh, compression and uh, dilatation. And so solutes can, uh, even in a very simple linear elastic way of thinking, uh, where you need no chemistry, uh, just by, by the fact that you have an expansion and a compression field, a solute will have a certain tendency to move into one of these two regions. Um, and I think we will hear more about this then in the specific presentation, student presentation. So I will not say anything more now about it. The next thing that I want to uh, discuss is uh, now the energy. We have seen uh, displacements, we have seen stresses, and we have seen strains. And now I just want to uh, uh, show you a derivation for the energy now that a dislocation um, uh, has. So this is the energy per unit length. Um, so it's it, the energy is uh, then always given a, as energy per uh, unit of length uh, of the dislocation. Uh, straight, a straightforward approach to get the energy would be to just use the equation that we have already seen, multiply strain and stress, uh, and uh, multiply that by one half, and you would get your result. You can even um, eliminate the stress here with, with Hooke's law and just uh, use the expression. That is one possibility but it's uh, a little bit difficult uh, to do the math related to it. And so there is a very convenient way of calculating and easy way of calculating uh, the, the, the energy of a dislocation by using the gauss ostrogratsky theorem, which I want to show you how it works. It's quite uh, uh, convenient. So to understand how the energy um, uh, the energy increases when we introduce a dislocation. That is the quantity we are interested. So we, we make the cut here and we displace the two surfaces with respect to each other and glue them together, right? So we, are, we end up with uh, the dislocation and now the energy is uh, higher than before, right? So, but how large is the energy that we need to apply or the, to invest to create a dislocation? That can be obtained with a very simple reasoning. So you can imagine that you do the cut and you displace the surfaces with respect to each other, and that will require a certain force. Uh, and then you can imagine that this force will, um, of course, uh, increase linearly as you keep moving uh, the two surfaces with respect to each other. It will increase linearly because it's linear elasticity. And then you will reach the point where you have displaced by the Burgess vector where you are done. And force times distance is, um, is always the expression for the, for, the, uh, for the energy, right? And it's just a simple um, mechanical expression. So, uh, and since the force increases linearly, then we have the factor one half, which has to go in front of it. Um, so, Essentially, the energy to increase, to introduce the, or to create the dislocation is given by the Burgess vector times the force that you have at the end when you have created the dislocation times one half, because the force increases linearly when you introduce this um, the dislocation. How is the force being calculated? Well, we know already the stress. That's very convenient. We know that the stress that um, arises exactly in this point where we are doing the displacement is given by this expression here. And now it's very simple uh, to, uh, to calculate the total force by just integrating the stress over x1. So um, here, this should be dx1. Sorry, I've just realized it uh, to be precise. It should be dx1 here. And uh, the stress times the area gives me the force contribution of a very thin stripe of thickness dx, right, and of length l. So uh, this here 
so um, sigma times L dx is the force of this very small stripe. And I have to add up all the stripes going to infinity from zero essentially to infinity. And I get uh, the result. Um, in practice, you take an outer radius and an inner radius and you integrate um, one over x1 um, between these two margins and you get this expression here. So one over x1 um, has to be integrated. That is the logarithm. And if you take now the two uh, limits, you have the logarithm of r uh, minus the logarithm of rc and that you can combine and you have logarithm of r divided by rc. And this is the expression for the energy of the, uh, uh, the dislocation um, um, shown here. Just have to check, yeah. Here is energy divided by length. We have just uh, taken now the, the uh, lengths on this side, and we see that we have the shear modulus times the Burgess vector squared divided by four pi times uh, logarithm uh, of r divided by rc. So sorry, so this is the force here. And now I have to insert this expression into the into here to get this result. So that's the right way. So this, this here is the force, uh, the total force um, that I have after inserting the um, uh, this location. I insert this f into this expression here and I get this result here. And this is now the energy per unit length, it's the line energy of this location. The same can be done for the edge dislocation. I will not go through it, it's completely anal analogous. You make the cut, you make the displacement, you use the expression for the stress that you know, and you insert it and you integrate from RC to R and you get the analogous uh, expression, which is very similar to the screw dislocation. So here we have the screw dislocation, here we have the edge dislocation. It's very similar with the only difference that you have here, one minus the Poisson ratio uh, in addition. So the energy is not the same for the edge dislocation. Uh, edge dislocations have, if the Burgess vectors were the same, um, edge dislocation have a higher uh, energy compared to the screw dislocation because this number is smaller than one. So the energy is higher than this one here. Okay, so um, we know now that the energy of a dislocation depends on the shear modulus, it depends on the square of the Burgess vector, and it also depends on the outer and inner cutoff radius that have to be uh, chosen. So the energy, in, in if you think about an infinite uh, medium and you introduce a dislocation, the energy is also infinite. Uh, so you can only get a finite expression you can do some calculations with if you choose an outer and a, a, an outer cutoff radius and if you choose the core radius. Uh, you can get rid of this infinity that arises from the core radius because if RC is, is zero, then this is infinite. So that's a problem. Uh, you can get rid of this uh, infinity by um, uh, the bias navarro mod model, for example, where you have then a nonlinear description in the core, but you can never get rid of this infinity of the outer cut of radius. And this has to be chosen appropriately uh, in any derivation. We will see it um, later, we'll make you aware. Sometimes uh, when you do a derivation or you find derivation in books, they use this expression for the uh, dislocation energy and they always have an implicit assumption on R <laughs> that sometimes is very hidden, uh, but sometimes it's, for example, the grain size or the typical expected distance between these locations. Um, so an assumption is always made on R in order to be able to do a calculation um, for the dislocation energy. Okay, so this was the dislocation energy. Uh, if we uh, use isotropic elasticity, we can um, add up the screw and the edge component of the dislocation uh, linearly, as shown here. So if we have a mixed dislocation uh, shown here, uh, we have the dislocation line um, as indicated here. The um, screw component would be uh, the parallel component and the edge component would be the normal component. 
of our dislocation, which is a certain angle theta to the dislocation line. So in this case, we have a mixed dislocation. And so we can just add up the two contributions um, uh, linearly. You see here, this is the screw component. This is the edge component. And you can rework it to give it this uh, appearance here where you introduce then the angle also conveniently into this uh, expression. Yeah, so uh, this is in the case we have a mixed dislocation. If we are not isotropic, everything gets much, much more complicated, as I said before. Um, in that case, you need to calculate uh, a tensor, the Stroh tensor, uh, which allows you to get to the general expression for the line energy. So the line energy in this case then is given by a multiplication of the Burgers vector with the Stroh tensor. Um, this part, the logarithm uh, of the outer cut of radius and the inner radius remain the same, but uh, this prefactor is different. Uh, Stroh tensor is not so easy to calculate. Uh, if you are really interested in that, I can give you a script. I've done this uh, because I needed to do it for dislocation properties. Um, if you're interested in, in, in seeing how the Stroh tensor can be really calculated, uh, I have a script. If you want to have it, I can give it to you. Yes, one more point uh, is the core energy. Um, so in reality, these locations um, in the core have not an infinite stress and strain field, but it's finite. We will see next lecture um, how this looks like with the Bias Navarro model. Uh, just one remark about then the core energy. One can imagine that um, uh, by taking a, a right choice for RCE and the inner cutoff radius, you can get the same energy as you would get if you did a, a, a non-linear calculation where the core is treated correctly. And in this way, you can define a core radius um, uh, by just saying, I want that my linear elastic expression is exactly equal to um, the, the one that I get when I, for example, use the bias Navarro model or I use uh, some atomistic model to calculate the dislocation, which gives me the energy um, directly. And I can I choose uh, the core radius exactly in, in, in that way that the energy, the linear elastic energy is the same. And it also allows me then to define uh, core energy um, and, and say that a dislocation has a core energy of, for example, 1 eV or, or whatever. Yeah, so this is um, a weakness of the linear elastic description that you have to choose a little bit arbitrarily a core radius and also um, an outer cutoff radius. Um, yeah, that's just um, a part of it. And uh, I will show you in later derivation when we will use linear elastic description of this location, uh, how this is then uh, done for the specific cases. The last point for today, and I think we are at the end of the lecture, is Frank's rule. This is, an, uh, uh, this is a very important rule to understand dissociation or uh, how this location combine or um, uh, separate. Um, it is based on uh, the fact that the energy is proportional to the square of the Burgess vector. And you have to think about uh, the square uh, in a, a vector sense. So um, one can see uh, if we have two dislocations which are parallel um, next to each other, and they have uh, some Burgess vector, which is shown here, then one can ask, uh, would it be energetically favorable for these two dislocation to form one, where we just add up the Burgess vector, or would it be uh, not favorable? And uh, if you just take a simple Pythagoras, you, you can see that if the angle of the two uh, Burgess vector is exactly 90 degrees, then of course it's exactly the same energy. And in that case, there is no difference between the energy of these two dislocations uh, if, if, I, if I add them up. 
uh, whereas if I have an angle which is uh, larger than um, uh, 90 degrees here, then it is actually favorable uh, for them to combine. Uh, I just had to say it right for no, for it, uh, then it's favorable for them to dissociate. Sorry. So if the angle is larger than 90 degrees, then they will dissociate. Uh, whereas if the angle is smaller, then they will combine and uh, the energy is lower if um, they form one dislocation. So we will see later in uh, the treatment of um, uh, dislocation in the FCC crystal, for example, that um, there the two partials are at an angle which is larger than, larger than 90 degrees. And for that reason, every dislocation FCC is dissociated because it's energetically favorable for a dislocation with, with a certain Burgess vector to uh, dissociate into two fractional dislocations. Okay, that's it for today. Um, next time we will then go into nonlinear description of dislocation with the Pius Navarro model. Um, but today I think we are done and uh, I hope it was uh, of use and you have uh, understood a few new things today. Are there any questions? There is silence, so I think there are no questions for the moment. I will stop my presentation to just see what we are still there. Yes. Okay, so next lecture will be next week. If you have no further questions, we just go on next time. I cannot hear you. You're all muted. <laughs> yes. See you next week. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very week. much. Thank Goodbye. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.